Glixnorp, the gelatinous blob of an alien instructor, wobbled slightly in what passed for exasperation in its species. Its voice synthesizer produced a sound reminiscent of a sigh mixed with a gurgle. As I said, Cadet Lancaster, this is a standard survival drill. You and your team will be dropped onto the surface of Zeta-9, where you will navigate through the terrain, locate the beacon, and signal for extraction. It's a simple exercise designed to test your basic survival skills. Jake glanced at his teammate Sarah, a wiry woman with a permanent smirk, and Zach, built like a refrigerator with the personality of a Labrador retriever. They both looked as confused as he felt. Right. Right, Jake nodded, a grin spreading across his face. And remind me again, what makes Zeta-9 so special that we need to practice surviving on it? Glixnorb's tentacles twitched in what Jake had learned was its equivalent of an eye roll. Zeta-9 is classified as a Class 12 death world. It has. I'm sorry, Sarah interrupted, her voice dripping with sarcasm. Did you just say death world? As in, a world full of death? Because that sounds like a fantastic place for a field trip. Really, top-notch choice there, Teach. Glick's Norb's color shifted to a deeper shade of purple, a sign of growing frustration. Yes, Cadet Roberts. Zeta-9 is considered extremely dangerous by Galactic Federation standards. It has highly variable weather patterns, aggressive fauna, and challenging terrain. The survival drill is designed to... To kill us, Zack chimed in, his booming voice filled with genuine curiosity rather than sarcasm. Because it kind of sounds like you're trying to kill us, sir. Ma'am. Ah, uh, respected gelatinous entity. Jake couldn't hold back anymore. He burst into laughter, doubling over and clutching his sides. Sarah joined in, her cackles mixing with Jake's guffaws, while Zack looked between them with a confused grin. Glick's Norp synthesizer produced a series of rapid-fire clicks and whistles the alien equivalent of a facepalm. I assure you, cadets, this is not an attempt on your lives. The drill is perfectly safe, by Galactic Federation standards. Oh well, that's reassuring Jake managed between bouts of laughter, because the Galactic Federation's idea of safe has been so in line with ours so far, right guys? Sarah wiped a tear from her eye, still giggling. Remember the routine physical, where they tried to remove our parasitic internal organs, or, or the standard atmospheric test that nearly suffocated us, because they forgot humans need oxygen, Zack added, his grin widening. Glick's Norb's color was now cycling through various shades of purple and blue, a clear sign of distress. Those were unfortunate misunderstandings. We have since adjusted our protocols to account for human physiology. Aha, uh -huh, Jake nodded, finally regaining his composure. And I'm sure those adjustments extend to choosing suitable planets for survival drills, right? The alien instructor's tentacles drooped slightly. The choice of Zeta-9 was made by the Galactic Federation's training committee. They believed it would provide an adequate challenge for species from less hospitable worlds. Sarah snorted. Less hospitable than a death world. What exactly do they think Earth is like? According to the official classification Glixnorp began, its synthesizer producing a sound suspiciously like a gulp, Earth is categorized as a Class 13 death world. There was a moment of stunned silence before all three humans burst into fresh peals of laughter. Oh man, Jake wheezed. We're from an even deadlier death world. That's, that's just perfect. Big Snorp's color stabilized to a resigned shade of lavender. Perhaps we should focus on the details of the drill. You will be equipped with standard survival gear, including... Hang on, Sarah interrupted, her eyes gleaming with mischief. What exactly makes Earth a class 13? I'm dying to know what's got the mighty Galactic Federation's tentacles in a twist. The alien instructor's synthesizer produced a series of rapid clicks the equivalent of a deep breath. Earth's classification is based on several factors, including but not limited to extreme temperature variations, high gravity, dangerous flora and fauna, unpredictable weather patterns, and the inexplicable tendency of its dominant species to actively seek out and engage in hazardous activities for fun. This sent the humans into another fit of laughter. Zack, wiping tears from his eyes, managed to ask, So, you're saying we're too extreme for the extreme survival drill? Glixnorb's tentacles waved in what might have been exasperation or surrender. The committee believed that Zeta-9 would provide a controlled environment to observe how. Beings from a Class 13 world handle survival situations. Jake, 
finally catching his breath, grinned widely. Oh, this is going to be fun. When do we start? The alien instructor's color shifted to a pale yellow, a sign of resignation mixed with a touch of fear. The drill begins in one standard rotation. Please report to the hangar bay for equipment check and deployment. As the three humans filed out of the briefing room, still chuckling and exchanging excited glances, Glixnorp's synthesizer produced a long, low whistle. It had a feeling that this particular survival drill was going to be educational, to say the least. The dropship shuddered as it entered Zeta 9's turbulent atmosphere. Jake, Sarah, and Zack were strapped into their seats, each wearing what passed for standard survival gear in the Galactic Federation. To the humans, it looked like a cross between a hazmat suit and a high-tech onesie. All right, Team Jake said, his voice barely audible over the roar of the engines. Let's go over the plan one more time. Sarah rolled her eyes. What plan? We drop, we survive, we win. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Zack nodded enthusiastically. Yeah, and if anything tries to eat us, I'll punch it. Simple. Jake couldn't help but grin. Okay, fair enough. But let's at least try to look like we're taking this seriously. Remember, the whole Federation is probably watching. Ooh, performance anxiety, Jake Sarah teased. Don't worry, I'm sure you'll do fine. Just pretend it's like that time we went camping in the Australian outback. Right, Jake snorted, because that went so well. Remind me, who was it that decided to try and wrestle a kangaroo? Zack raised his hand proudly. That was me. Did you know they can't hop backwards? I learned that the hard way. The dropship gave another violent shake, cutting off any further conversation. A red light began flashing, and a synthesized voice announced, prepare for deployment in three, two, one. With a hiss of hydraulics, the floor beneath them opened up, and the three humans were suddenly in free fall, plummeting towards the surface of Zeta-9. As they fell, Jake activated his comms. Remember, standard formation. Sarah, take point once we land. Zack, you're on rear guard. I'll handle navigation. Roger that, Captain Buzzkill Sarah's voice crackled over the comms, followed by her exhilarated whoop as she maneuvered through the air. The ground was rushing up to meet them at an alarming rate. Jake could make out vast purple forests, winding rivers of what looked like liquid metal, and in the distance, a mountain range that seemed to be. Moving? Shoots deployed Zack called out, his massive frame suddenly slowing as the Federation issue parachute blossomed above him. Jake and Sarah followed suit, and soon all three were drifting towards a clearing in the alien forest. As they neared the ground, Jake could see movement in the trees, lots of movement. Heads up, folks, he called out. Looks like we've got a welcoming committee. They touched down in the clearing, quickly detaching from their chutes and forming a tight triangle, backs to each other. The trees around them were more like giant, pulsating fungi, their surfaces rippling with what looked unsettlingly like muscle fibers. Well, Sarah said, her voice a mix of awe and sarcasm. This looks like a lovely place for a picnic. Anyone bring the potato salad? Before anyone could respond, the ground beneath their feet began to tremble. From the edge of the clearing, a massive creature emerged. It looked like someone had taken a centipede, blown it up to the size of a bus, and then decided it needed more legs and a lot more teeth. Dibs Zack called out excitedly, cracking his knuckles. Jake sighed. Zack, we've talked about this. You can't call Dibs on alien monsters. Why not? I saw it first. The creature let out a roar that sounded like a thousand nails on a chalkboard and charged towards them. Sarah unholstered what looked like a high-tech Super Soaker Standard Federation non-lethal defense equipment. Well, boys, shall we show this overgrown silverfish how we do things on Earth? With grins that would have sent any sane being running for the hills, the three humans spread out and prepared to face their first Zeta-9 challenge. Back on the Galactic Federation training station, a group of alien observers watched the unfolding scene with a mix of horror and fascination. Glix Norp, who had been roped into providing commentary, was rapidly changing colors as it tried to make sense of what it was seeing. As you can see it burbled into the recorder, the human cadets have encountered a Zeta-9 megathropod, a highly aggressive predator known for its acidic saliva and paralyzing sting. Standard procedure would be to seek immediate cover and oh my. On the screen, Zack had just launched himself at the creature's face, 
latching onto one of its mandibles and attempting to ride it. Get M. Cowboy Sarah's voice came through the speakers, followed by the sound of her weapon discharging. A stream of bright blue liquid arced through the air, hitting the megarthropod's carapace and immediately starting to smoke. It appears Glick's Norp continued, its voice synthesizer struggling to convey its disbelief that Cadet Roberts has modified her standard issue neutralizing solution to be highly acidic. That's, that's not regulation. Jake's voice crackled through next. Sarah, watch the spray pattern. Zack, stop trying to put it in a headlock. It doesn't even have a head. The alien observers watched in stunned silence as the three humans, instead of running away or calling for extraction, proceeded to take on the megarthropod with a combination of improvised weapons, bare-handed grappling, and what appeared to be combat techniques designed for much small opponents. This is unprecedented, one of the observers, a multi-eyed being from a low-gravity world, whispered in awe. They're actually enjoying themselves. Indeed, amidst the chaos of acid sprays, flailing limbs, and the megarthropod's increasingly distressed shrieks, the sound of human laughter could be clearly heard. Yeehaw Zack's booming voice echoed across the clearing as he managed to wrap his arms around two of the creature's legs, actually lifting the front end off the ground. Sarah darted in, her acid sprayer modified again, this time to produce a stream of what looked suspiciously like fire. Flame on, bug boy. Jake, meanwhile, had somehow climbed onto the creature's back and was attempting to steer it by yanking on its antennae. I think I've figured out the controls, guys. It's like a really angry jet ski. Glick's Norb's color had faded to a pale, shocked white. This, this is not how the survival drill is supposed to go, it muttered, forgetting for a moment that it was still recording. They're supposed to be surviving, not, not turning the local fauna into improvised vehicles. The megarthropod, clearly regretting every life choice that had led it to this moment, let out one final, pitiful shriek before collapsing to the ground. The three humans, covered in a mixture of sweat, dirt, and what was probably highly toxic alien blood, stood triumphantly over their fallen foe. Well, Jake said, brushing off his hands, that was a nice warm-up. What's next? The alien observers looked at each other in shock. One of them, a floating gas bag with numerous eye stalks, finally spoke up. Warm up. That was supposed to be the main challenge of the entire drill. Glick Snorp, realizing it was still recording, quickly pulled itself together. Ahem. As we can see, the human cadets have successfully neutralized the local wildlife and are ready to proceed to the next phase of the drill. Which is finding that beacon thingy, right Sarah's voice came through, startlingly clear. Apparently, the humans had figured out how to boost their comm signal. Don't suppose you could give us a hint? Like, is it more towards the acid lakes or the carnivorous mountain range? There was a moment of panicked silence in the observation room before one of the aliens hesitantly leaned towards the microphone. The beacon is in the direction of the temporal anomaly fields. Sweet Zack's enthusiasm was palpable, even through the speakers. I've always wanted to mess with the space-time continuum. As the humans set off towards what was supposed to be the most dangerous part of the planet, Glick's Norp turned to its fellow observers, its color a mix of terrified gray and impressed gold. I believe it said slowly, we may need to reconsider our definition of survival training when it comes to species from Class 13 Death Worlds. The journey through Zeta 9's hellscape was, to put it mildly, not going according to the Galactic Federation's carefully planned scenario. Jake, Sarah, and Zack treated each new, horrifying challenge as if it were an attraction at some demented amusement park. They traversed fields of razor-sharp crystal formations, using them as improvised climbing walls and occasionally harvesting pieces to use as makeshift tools. Hey guys, Zack called out at one point, holding up a particularly wicked-looking shard, think this would make a good can opener. When they encountered a river of what appeared to be liquid mercury, but was actually a colony of microscopic metallic organisms, Sarah's response was to pull out a collapsible cup from her gear. Anyone up for a drink? It's like a billion little terminators in your mouth. Jake had to physically restrain her from taking a sip. Let's save the potentially lethal alien beverages for after we complete the mission, shall we? As they neared the temporal anomaly fields, the very fabric of reality began to warp around them. Trees grew, died, and fossilized in the span of seconds. Rocks eroded into sand and then reformed in swirling patterns. It wow, Jake mused, 
watching a nearby mountain age millions of years in the blink of an eye. It's like the entire planet is on fast forward. Think of the geological data we could gather here. Sarah rolled her eyes. Trust you to turn a life-threatening situation into a science project. Although she paused, a mischievous glint in her eye, I wonder what would happen if we threw something alive in there. Before Jake could protest, Zack had already launched a small, beetle-like creature he'd picked up earlier into the anomaly. They watched in fascination as it rapidly evolved through several stages, growing wings, then losing them, then developing what looked like laser eyes before finally turning into a small, sentient crystal that floated away, presumably contemplating its existence. Huzak said, scratching his head. Do you think that counts as playing God? Because if so, I think I'm pretty good at it. Jake pinched the bridge of his nose. Let's just, let's just find the beacon, okay? Before we accidentally create a new sentient species or something. As they ventured deeper into the anomaly field, the temporal shifts became more pronounced. At one point, Sarah found herself having a conversation with future versions of Jake and Zack, while her present-day teammates watched in bewilderment. So, do we make it? She asked her future companions. Future Jake grinned. Oh, we make it all right. But I can't tell you how, because that would create a paradox. Also, when you get to the part with the time-traveling carnivorous plants, remember aim for the stems, not the flowers. Time-traveling carnivorous plants present day Jake groaned. Of course that's a thing here. As if on cue, the ground beneath them erupted with writhing, tentacle-like vines. The plants seemed to phase in and out of existence, appearing as seeds one moment and fully grown the next. Well, Sarah said, igniting her makeshift flamethrower, at least they were kind enough to announce themselves. Shall we garden, gentlemen? What followed was a chaotic dance of flames, fists, and frenzied flora. Zack, true to form, attempted to wrestle the largest plant into submission, only to find himself flung backwards in time by about five minutes. Guys, his voice crackled over the comms from a position they'd passed earlier. You're not going to believe what just happened. Let me guess Jake called back, dodging a particularly aggressive vine. You tried to suplex a plant and got time warped. Dot, 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 okay. Maybe you will believe it. As they battled their way through the temporal vegetable patch, something unexpected happened. The beacon they were searching for suddenly materialized right in front of them, blinking and beeping innocuously. Sarah eyed it suspiciously. Well, that's convenient. Think it's a trap? Jake shrugged. Probably. But hey, that's what we're here for, right? To expect the unexpected and survive anyway. Zack, who had finally caught up with them, or perhaps arrived from the future it was getting hard to tell, cracked his knuckles. I say we smash it and see what happens. We are not smashing the billion credit piece of Federation equipment, Jake said firmly. We're going to activate it properly and call for extraction like responsible cadets. Sarah and Zack both made exaggerated pouty faces. Boring, they said in unison. As Jake reached for the beacon, the air around them shimmered. Suddenly, they found themselves surrounded by dozens of copies of themselves from various points in time. Oh, come on, one of the Jakes, possibly from the future, groaned. Not this again, again, present day, Jake asked. How many times does this happen? You don't want to know a battle-worn Sarah from what was hopefully an alternate timeline, replied. Just activate the beacon already. Trust me, it gets old fast. With a shrug, Jake pressed the activation button on the beacon. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, with a sound like the universe hiccuping, everything around them seemed to shift. The temporal copies vanished. The carnivorous plants retreated into the ground. Even the strange, shimmering quality of the air dissipated. In the sudden, almost oppressive silence, the beacon's steady beeping seemed impossibly loud. Ha, Zack said, looking around. Is it just me, or did we just break this planet? Before anyone could respond, a familiar voice crackled over their comms. It was Glick's Norp, sounding even more flustered than usual. A cadet's the alien instructor burbled, what did you do? The entire temporal anomaly field has stabilized. That's not supposed to be possible. Sarah grinned. Does this mean we passed the test with flying colors? There was a long pause before Glick's Norp responded. The Galactic Federation Training Committee is reviewing the data from your trial. Extraction ships are on their way. Please try not to alter any more fundamental laws of physics before they arrive. As the comm link cut out, the three humans looked at each other, then burst into laughter. You know, Jake said, 
wiping tears from his eyes. I have a feeling this might change the Federation's approach to survival training for us Earthlings. Sarah nodded, still chuckling. Yeah, next time they'll probably just ask us to sit quietly in a padded room for a few hours. It'd be safer for everyone involved. Poor Zack pouted. But where's the fun in that? As the extraction ships appeared on the horizon, the three cadets sat down next to the beacon, casually swapping stories about their individual temporal adventures while they waited. To any outside observer, they might have looked like friends chatting after a mildly exciting hike rather than survivors of what was supposed to be the most grueling survival test in the galaxy. Back on the Galactic Federation training station, chaos reigned. Aliens of various species rushed about, analyzing data, arguing over reports, and generally trying to make sense of what had just transpired. Glixnorp found itself at the center of it all, its color cycling through a rainbow of confused and excited hues. A high-ranking official, a being that looked like a cross between a praying mantis and a supercomputer, approached the flustered instructor. Explain the official demanded, its voice a series of clicks and whirs. Glixnorp's tentacles waved helplessly. I, I'm not sure I can, exalted one. The humans, they, they treated the survival drill like some sort of recreational activity. They engaged with apex predators, turned deadly obstacles into improvised tools, and somehow managed to stabilize a temporal anomaly field that our top scientists have been studying for centuries. The official's antennae twitched in what might have been disbelief. And you say this is normal for their species, based on my observations? Yes, Glixnorp replied. In fact, I believe they found the experience rather tame. The official was silent for a long moment, its compound eyes flickering as it processed this information. Finally, it spoke. We must reassess our entire approach to interspecies training programs, and perhaps, perhaps we should consider a cultural exchange program with Earth. Glixnorp's color paled. Exalted one, are you suggesting we send our cadets to train on a Class 13 death world? Indeed, the official replied, a hint of excitement creeping into its synthesized voice. If we are to face the challenges of this galaxy, we must learn from those who treat such challenges as entertainment. As the official moved away to convene an emergency meeting of the training committee, Glixnorp found itself staring at the monitor displaying the three human cadets. They were currently engaged in what appeared to be a game of rock-paper-scissors while they waited for extraction. May the cosmic forces have mercy on us all, Glixnorp burbled to itself. The galaxy isn't ready for humanity's idea of fun. Epilogue. Three standard rotations later, Jake, Sarah, and Zack found themselves standing before the Galactic Federation's training committee. The assembled aliens regarded the humans with a mixture of fear, awe, and poorly disguised curiosity. The mantis-like official who had spoken with Glixnorp addressed them. Cadets, your performance on Zeta-9 was unprecedented. You have single-handedly forced us to reconsider our entire approach to survival training. Jake stepped forward, trying his best to look serious. We apologize if we caused any problems, sir. We were simply trying to complete the mission to the best of our abilities. Sarah coughed in a way that sounded suspiciously like overachiever. The official's antennae twitched. Problems? Cadet, you solved problems we didn't even know we had. Your Unconventional approaches have opened up new avenues of research in temporal physics, xenobiology, and adaptive technology. Zack beamed. So, does this mean we get extra credit? A ripple of what might have been laughter, or possibly terror, ran through the assembled aliens. Credit is hardly adequate, the official continued. We have a proposal for you. The Galactic Federation would like to establish a new training program, led by you three. The humans exchanged surprised glances, US Jake asked. But we're just cadets, Glixnorp, who was hovering nearby, its color a mix of pride and resignation, spoke up. Cadets who managed to turn a Class 12 death world into a playground. The Federation believes that your unique perspective could be invaluable in preparing our forces for the unknown challenges of the galaxy, Sarah grinned. So, you want us to teach other aliens how to have fun while surviving impossible odds? Count me in, I get to wrestle more alien monsters, right Zack asked eagerly. The official's compound eyes flickered rapidly the closest it could come to a sigh. Within reason, and with proper safety protocols, yes. Jake looked at his teammates, then back at the committee. A slow smile spread across his face. Well, ladies, gentlemen, and assorted sentient beings, 
I believe we accept your offer. When do we start? As the details of the new program were hashed out, Glick's Norp found itself reflecting on the strange turn of events. It had set out to teach these humans how to survive in a hostile universe. Instead, the humans had taught the Galactic Federation a valuable lesson sometimes. The best way to survive was to thrive, to find joy and excitement in the face of adversity. The universe was vast, dangerous, and full of unknowns. But with humanity joining the ranks of the Galactic Federation, bringing their unique blend of ingenuity, resilience, and borderline insane enthusiasm, well, the future was certainly going to be interesting. As the meeting adjourned, and the humans excitedly began planning their first lesson which, worryingly, seemed to involve something called extreme sports, Glixnorp made a mental note to update its will. Teaching alongside these earthlings was bound to be the greatest adventure and possibly the greatest hazard of its life. But as it watched the three humans animatedly discussing how to turn asteroid fields into obstacle courses, Glixnorp felt something it hadn't experienced in a long time genuine excitement for the future. The galaxy didn't stand a chance. 